everybody got stronger who trained Westside. Everybody. There was nobody that didn't. So, and there were a lot of people. So. Get the fuck up. Simon says, get the fuck up. Throw your hands in the sky. Now, some of the misconceptions with Westside that during the 90s and into the early 2000s, the, the big ones that just keep coming up over and over again are Westside was designed for geared lifting, which is not true. The entire time, I came from competing from 83 until maybe around 88, 90, right around that range. I started doing some of Louis stuff, just talking to him over the phone before I actually moved to Columbus. But, and I use linear periodization, many different forms of that, pretty much every possible form you could think of. And I used, uh, my, uh, my approach to gear was, I wore knee wraps with every set that was over 405. It didn't matter if it was off season or if it was pre-contest. Knee wraps started, you know, week one, you know, of the training and training could be a 12 week cycle, 16 week cycle, just that all depended upon how weak and out of shape I got and how much hypertrophy work I needed to be able to get where I, to back up to my weight class because I dropped weight pretty easy. And about eight weeks out, I'm just kind of guessing here now, I'd have to go back and look at some of the old training cycles. I'd start to put briefs on with the knee wraps. And then a couple weeks after that, it would be briefs and the suit with the straps down, you know, with the knee wraps on the last couple sets. And then during the peak phase, which would have been the triples and the singles, it would have been straps up, basically full gear for those three weeks. And that's how I spent, that's how I was introduced to the sport. My first, that's how my first meet was. And we didn't have raw divisions back then. So it was, it was all geared. Now I didn't know, I didn't know that um, double ply even existed until I came to Westside because it really wasn't advertised. And nothing wrong with that. I was all about it. Once I found out about it, I was just a little pissed off. I didn't know about it beforehand, but that's, that's how I trained. So coming to Westside and have Louie tell me leave that shit at home. You know, the only thing that you're going to use is briefs on the dynamic squat day to help, you know, with the hips because of the wide stance. I also was not a wide stance squatter coming into West side either. So I really don't remember any of us having gym bags except for when we went to a meet. So it's, I had my belt, you tied the knee wraps around your belt and maybe one elbow sleeve that went on the belt, you cinched the belt and you threw it on the belt squat and that's where it stayed. So, you know, you, you wore whatever shoes that you wore. Normally I trained in the morning, so it was just a matter of wearing chucks on Friday when I squatted, but all the rest of the time it was whatever I'd wear to work is what I would wear to train in. And there's no gym bag and the briefs just stayed in the back of the truck. I mean, it's just kind of how it was. So the only time that we put gear on was two times when we would order it and we would get it, we'd put it on to make sure it fit, but we never did anything with it. We just put it on and it's like, that feels right. You know, it feels tight, it feels good. Take it off and you're done. You break it out and you wear it for the meat. That was, the extent of the gear use for 10 years that I was the first 10 years that I was at Westside and did it fuck with my head? Yeah, it fucked with my head because I was used to having, I talked about the knee wraps and the squat suit, but for the bench, it was wearing the bench shirt pretty much from fives all the way to singles on the training cycle. And so half your training cycle, pretty much to not using the bench shirt at all none just going to the meet and putting the shirt on that took a little getting used to but it worked out because we didn't have to worry about it and how to cycle it and how to put it in the training and 
the philosophy at the time was just get fucking stronger. If you get stronger, you're going to be stronger in the gear. So that's, that's how the whole training was set up. So the training was not set up for fucking gear. The training was set up to get stronger. So then when you get in the gear, you're going to be stronger in the gear. We could have went to the meet and them say, don't use gear today, which many of the guys would forget their bench shirt. And George Halbert did this several times. I did it once. And you just benched raw. You just adjusted whatever the opener was and benched raw because you didn't, it wasn't like you were used to training in the gear because we never used it except for the briefs. The downside of that was, and I was guilty of this a couple times, is if you weighed in and you hadn't even put your gear on, I mean, there were times I'd go a year if I got hurt and missed a meet and was competing twice a year, I would go close to a year without even putting my gear on and then train for me and then go and blow it up too much after weigh-ins and the gear's too tight. And then I end up bombing out because I can't get close to fucking depth because my squat suit's so tight, I'm barely getting it out of the rack to begin with, or the bench shirt blows out or something like that happens. So there, there, were, there were consequences of this that weren't exactly the best either but the, the training is what I'm getting back to here is the the misconception there is that the training was all based around getting this carryover out of gear which is just bullshit and it doesn't address all the coaches that came in and after being at Westside maybe three four years it started to pick up a little bit more popularity with the coaching with strength coaches and I would say every weekend for the remainder of the time I was there, there was one or more coaches that were visiting during that time. And then all those coaches would go use, I don't want to say they used the program verbatim, but some did, but let's just assume that most did not, you know, would, would take components of the program back and then use it with their athletes and have success. And they most certainly were not wearing gear with their athletes. You know, so they were all making progress, you know, so and so that's that's the first misconception that this conjugate West Side thing was designed around gear. Now, I will say getting into the 2000s when gear started to change and people were starting to get bigger carryovers. And I'm not so much sure. I mean, the gear did change, but I think that. You know, the gear changed, but people weren't getting the carryovers for a few years after the change. And then people started putting a lot of time into learning the gear to get a bigger carryover. And that's when shit really started to change. Because, for example, with my bench, maybe I would get a 20 to 40 pound carryover on the bench shirt. Sometimes it was so uncomfortable, I'd just rather not fucking wear it. Um, I, I could do with that. If I squatted well, I'd rather just not wear the fucking shirt um, and still you know, get the total that way. When people started to get 80, 100, and 200, and then it got up to, there were some people that were getting 300 pounds out of their bench shirt. And I, I can explain the reasons why for that too. But that's when you had to start to learn the skill of the shirt because you're giving up too much. You're going to a meet and you're getting beat by people who are significantly not as strong as you are, but they, they're better skilled. So there's, there's that. It, it brought a different aspect to the sport that the sport didn't have before. Where at the, at the very introduction of the sport to me which was pretty much just single ply gear that you just hope to hell it didn't blow out and you you were competing with you know whoever the strongest was going to win so if they if they had better genetics than you did you know better leverages than you did and all things being equal except for that which doesn't make it equal but you're never going to beat the guy there there's there's no way you can, you can have slightly better technique and make up a little ground if their technique isn't so good. You can call better lifts, you know, and try to make up ground that way. But if you have somebody that's just a genetic outlier, you're, you're gonna lose. 
you know, that was just kind of the nature of the sport and still is, and that's the nature of every sport. But when gear came around and it started to become to where you could get these bigger carryovers, significant carryovers, and you had people who may not have the genetic advantages of somebody else, but they work that skill aspect of the gear. Cause you couldn't just put the shit on and get a 200 pound carryover. If you just threw the shit on thinking that you were going to get any carryover, you'd probably knock your teeth out. You, you, you have, you have to know what the hell you're doing and it's not easy. It's nowhere near as easy as people think it is. And just ask anybody that competed with multiply or even does today. It's not fucking easy. You know, it's, you can get a carryover that's that I will say is pretty easy. You can get the carryover, but you got to get the carryover with the depth, which changes things. Then if you want to get the big carryover, then you need to know how to tweak the gear and how to use the gear. And you need to be skilled at it and know when to relax, when to flex. I mean, it's, it's the whole skill set behind that, which allowed somebody who, maybe didn't have the genetic abilities to be great to kick the ass to somebody who had great genetic abilities, but was fucking lazy and didn't want to train. So it was, it was an equalizer. And what happened during the two thousands is people really started to hone their skills of the gear. And we weren't, you know, I'll, I'll admit, I don't know if Louie will, but maybe, maybe he will other people at the time that I trained with will admit, we were late to the game with that. We should have been a little bit sooner to it, but we were all hard headed about it. And, you know, it took time before we embraced even trying to use that gear. And then, then it becomes an issue of fuck, you know, how, how are we going to train for this and still get the other training done? So it, it made things a lot more complex, which some of the other questions are about how to use gear in the training, because it really did, because it took everything that we had that was kind of working perfectly for building strength and, and getting everybody stronger. And to step back during the time I was there from 90 to 2000, there, there was not one single person that came in that gym that didn't get stronger if they stayed. If they came in and stayed, they got stronger, they got significantly stronger. So based upon just that and me living in that vacuum from my experience, everybody got stronger who trained Westside, everybody. There was nobody that didn't. So, and there were a lot of people. So, and before I got there, I was one of the first guys to be recruited into Westside. I was the first guy to be recruited and that was from outside of Columbus. I do believe Louie had 70 elite totals that have already were earned in the gym. I wasn't allowed to make the elite total board until I did it in a different weight class than I did before getting there.